People came up to me during the break and said, oh, we've got plenty of questions we like to ask, so, so bring it on. Um, anybody has a question, just come right up here and so you can get on the air and uh, just hand the mic to you. So, so. Fellow Tihe Ake Ailoa, Soli Nihel. Mai no mai pu kapo o moku o ke ave. The question I, w I would like to address is to the panel that uh, uh, I know most of you are young people, uh, including uh, <laughs> this young fellow at the end. Uh, I remember him very explicitly. I was working in the uh, anti poverty program in Hawaii. And we had this young, bright uh, person that uh, was assigned to my project. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting in that uh, our project, although it's been the most successful in the Model Cities program, uh, we, were, we were the most radical. On my staff, I had people like Lihua Lopez. Uh, we had. Uh, the mother of our re revolution, uh, Moana Kaka. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, this guy, uh, uh, Melvin Pang, who is now the education director of the ILWU. As there were some of our contemporaries in my staff. And uh, my question to this uh, uh, panel is that it's in regards to First of all, who are the beneficiaries of our Aina? Second question is, what is the difference between a government entity and a government? Third, and last, what are your projections in regards to the restoration of our Lahui? Mahalo. I think I might be able to answer all three one time. Um, when we're looking at trying to find an answer to something. It's like looking at a word problem. Before you can solve a word problem, you have to know the basics of what is arithmetic. Yeah? Plus, minus, times, divide. Basic stuff. Then you can start to work on an answer to a word problem. What we first need to do is to first of all understand certain terminology, like add, subtract, divide. One thing that we need to understand, first of all, when we, when, we, when we speak of sovereignty, when we speak of nation, when we speak of, of nationals, they're actually all different and distinct. Okay? Give you an example. When Iraq, Iraq since 1932, was recognized as an independent sovereign state, an independent nation. Okay? Well, I would say state. An independent nation, state. In, 19, in 2003, that Iraqi government was overthrown, militarily, annihilated. Everybody saw it on CNN, gone. The question I ask you right there is, when the government was overthrown, was the country of Iraq overthrown? No. That situation is what we call occupation. That's what we call occupation, because the country is called a state. That is the subject of what is called international law. It has a defined border, okay? it has a governing body, 
It has national population. It has a defined territory, which is borders, as I already said, and the ability to enter into foreign relations. The government that enters into foreign relations merely exercises the authority of that state or that country. It is not the state itself. So you can overthrow a government without overthrowing the sovereign state. And what is required by those who overthrew that government, they are mandated to administer the laws of that state by fact that they overthrew that government. That's why in Iraq, the Coalition Provisional Authority was created. And they were administering Iraqi law. They were administering congressional law. Now, for Hawaii, the Hawaiian Kingdom was a recognized sovereign state since November 28, 1843. In fact, November 28 was a national holiday, or should I say is a national holiday. La Kuokoa, Independence Day. 1893 was supposed to have been the 50th anniversary of independence. If you read all the newspapers back then, leading up to, Janu uh, leading up to 1893, January, uh, leading up to November, great celebration. Unbelievable. So Hawaii clearly was an independent state. What was overthrown in 1893 was the government, not the country. And as Governor Waihei pointed out, executive agreements provide how that government is going to be restored, not the state, not the country. The mere fact that the queen entered into an agreement with the president after the overthrow of the government is an indication that the country still exists, but the government was not operating. That was the whole basis of the negotiation and why the queen, as a condition of restoration, she would grant amnesty after the government's restored because she did not have what is called the executive power yet. It was still assigned to the president. That was all part of the negotiations. Now, what's interesting is that, that, narr that narrative that I just shared with you was published, in front, is in, was published in front page newspapers all over the United States on January 14, 1893. We didn't know that. Now we do because the United States Cong uh, Congressional Library has what is called Chronicling America. You can actually Google this stuff. Not Google, but do a, a search. It all pops up. Like, wow, it's all in English, too. <laughs> now, then we get into if only the government was overthrown, then the state still exists, then who are the nationals of this country called the Hawaiian Kingdom that was internationally recognized? Because I'm going to answer this question because that is different from who are the beneficiaries of the land itself. That's where we're going to get into what is called native tenant rights. That's different. The first step is who are the nationals of this country? So who were the nationals of the country in 1893? The term was Hawaiian subjects. Hawaiian subjects, because it's a monarchical system. Okay? Hawaiian is actually a nationality. We use it wrong today. We think it's ethnicity. It's a nationality. So Hawaiian is short for Hawaiian subject. British is short for British subject. So you can be non-native or non-aboriginal and be Hawaiian. Let's point you to uh, Article 13 of Bernice Powahi's will. You guys can Google it. Go uh, type in Bernice Powahi will, ksbe.edu. Go look at that. Article 13 says, financial aid will be given to those Hawaiians of Aboriginal blood, pure or part. What that means is Hawaiians are not necessarily Aboriginal you got Hawaiians that are non-Aboriginal, which include people like Sanford Dole, Lauren Thurston. They're criminals. They committed a crime called high treason, but they were Hawaiian nationals. In fact, James Blunt, in his report, referred to them as Native Hawaiian. Native Hawaiian. See, the terms we got to understand because we don't understand what James Blunt said back then as a presidential investigator. The term Native Hawaiian He's making reference to the fact that they were natural born in Hawaii. Native, natural born, Hawaiian subjects, but Caucasian. The majority of the nationals in the kingdom in 1890, the last government census, 48,000. No, 41,000 of 48,000. 85% of the national population were natives, aboriginals. That was the majority. The rest... The 15% were non-natives. So that's what we call nationality. That's the nationality issue. Now, once a country is occupied, I'm going to get to the native tenant rights. Once a country is occupied, it affects the ability to acquire Hawaiian citizenship or the citizenship of an occupied state. Under Hawaiian kingdom law, three ways to acquire citizenship. Born on the soil, called you soli, okay, called native born. 
or natural born. Second is use sanguinis, which is parentage, maybe born abroad. Let's say a, a, a Hawaiian subjects, their, their family is visiting Washington, D.C. The child born in Washington may be an American by birth on the soil, but is a Hawaiian by parentage. That's a dual citizen. And the third way is naturalization. You've got to apply. Normally, there's a five-year residence. Well, there is a five-year residency according to the statute. But once a country is occupied, international law kicks in, where the only way that you can acquire citizenship of an occupied territory is by parents, you sanguinis. It outlaws the acquisition of citizenship by birth on the territory. And it outlaws the acquisition of citizenship by naturalization because, one, the government isn't there. It was overthrown. It's occupied. And it prevents people from acquiring citizenship by birth on the territory because it would prevent the occupier from flooding the territory with its own citizenry and overwhelm the national population. Recently, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that Palestine was an occupied territory and the Jewish refugees that are there in the settlement camps cannot claim to have acquired Palestinian nationality because their children gave birth, they're still Israeli. That's another aspect. So what we have then is looking at the national population from 1890, pretty much the same till today because it protects the status quo. What we have are a lot of people here who are not Hawaiian subjects. So really, from a political standpoint, we're still the majority. The rest are all aliens. Now then we get into the land itself. There is a clause, a condition of title, koinae nakuleano nakanakamaloko, reserving the rights of native tenants. What does that mean? People say, oh, let's go back to the issue of um, Nancy. Yeah? Kwanaiki. Uh, if you're native, you can go pick Lawae. Yeah? You go pick, uh, gather a uh, Opaiula. That's what native tenant rights is. Actually, native tenant rights goes back to the Mahele. It was a condition of the Mahele where native tenants can divide out their interests and acquire fee simple title whenever they desire such a division. And that's a condition of when the chiefs agreed and signed off on the Mahele. They say, I consent to this division. Yeah? It is good. The land's given to the king. I have no more rights within. Then he turns around, gives it back, and what's included in there is the recognition of native tenant rights. And they have to divide out their interests whenever. So what happens is the mahele becomes an instrument of dividing land all the way till today. This idea that, oh, we, you failed to provide your, your claim to the land commission. That's not true. Who made that decision? Judd in the Republic of Hawaii. Wrong court. The guy's a criminal. So when you look at native tenant rights, natives, as all of us here, just one drop of native blood, aboriginal, pure part, we have an undivided right in the land. That I can clarify and qualify. But that's just another indication of what our history holds that we don't know today. There's so much there. A lot of times what we do is we look at history, we think our kupuna didn't know what they were doing. No, they were quite intelligent. Once we start to look at our kupuna, here we thought, oh, I, gotta, I, I wish my tutu would have done this. Now I realize I'm stepping into my tutu shoes. I'm like, these shoes are huge. We still got to grow into them, let alone grow ourselves and move. So the idea of, to close for my, for my answer to your question, Soli, the country still exists. It's called occupation. And the nationality of that country that is occupied, the majority are natives and that we also provide and have vested undivided right under the rights of native tenants, which is a condition of the land title itself. Just to add to uh, Keanu's, especially, you know, uh, you know, as I said, you know, I told Keanu, you know, to me, he's the greatest, greatest historian of our generation in regards to uh, Hawaiian Kingdom and Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution and so forth. And um, but me is a storyteller. One of the things I like to uh, look back is to, you know, with that question, who are the beneficiaries of the aina? And I like to kind of play with understanding uh, beneficiaries, perhaps in a different way, outside of the legal perspective. And we can look at many of our mo'olelo, whether it's the kumulipo. Hanao ke ekaha, noho ikai, kia ika ekaha kaha, noho yuka, he po, he eka va, va, he nuku, he va, eka eklao, o ke akua ke komo, a oi komo kanaka. So, using the uh, mo'okauhau or mele kumulipo, 
to inform us in a cultural sense. Beneficiary of the Ayin are all those that come before us also. The Kumulipo teaches us that we as the Kanaka are in fact the last in this great Ohana and Mo'oku'ohau. Starting with the stars and the cosmos above and later down, life begins in the ocean. So in the beginning with the ocean, with the coral and the limo. Into the second wa, we have all the swimmer and animals, the fish-like animals. The third wa, we have the flyers. The fourth wa, we get the creepers and crawlers and the egg layers. In the fifth wa, we have uh, the, the pig-like animals. The sixth wa, we have the uh, rat-like animals. Seventh wa, we have the dog-like animals. And then finally... In the eighth wa, we have the first kanaka, la'i la'i, and ki'i, and kane, and kanaloa. But what it tells me, when I look at beneficial, when we look at aina, we as kanaka cannot be separate from our environment. It also tells us we as kanaka are also part of a greater ohana. He ka aina, he kawa ke kanaka. So, the Western Holy World has taught us many times as in their, their religious philosophical views, man shall have dominion over everything. That's what they try to teach us. In our mo'olelo, he aina, he kawa ke kanaka. So all of that which is upon the aina is part of us. We are part of them. O ke akua ke komo a oi komo kanaka. Every life form has akua within it, as we do. So what it says, that everything is la'a, everything out there is also kapu. So when I try to you know, untangle that question, I kind of, I want to rem remind myself to remember sometimes that we have to start with our genesis of our own understanding of who we are. So the beneficiaries, we as humans, we can be arrogant sometimes as human beings. Eh? We think it's all about us. But that us is really Papahanaumoku, the ukukuakoa, and all the living things around us also. And that's something we have to remind ourselves uh, in all our decisions, in what we do. And even that question again, when I said, you know, ea o kaaina, wumauke ea o kaaina. Can you have ea o kaaina without the fishes in the sea? without a healthy birds, without water flowing into the ocean. The word air, people like define them, dictionary, all kinds of different ways, life of the land, you get uh, sovereignty, independence, but air is deeper than that. Air is that godliness, is that, is that which makes us alive, which makes us move, which makes so-called evolution to occur between the life forms. That's air. So how do we perpetuate that into the future? That's always the question we have to remember. And there's many ways our kupunai called ourselves. Eya Hawaii, he moku he kanaka. He kanaka Hawaii, ye. He kanaka Hawaii. Kanaka Hawaii, we called ourselves Oivi. Called ourselves Lahui Kanaka. And these are terms that, to me, you know, it keeps us from being confused sometimes because the holy world, they like to play with words many times. You know, are we indigenous people? Are we natives? Are we aboriginal? And depending on what court or what place and what you get entangled. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying, saying in my perspective, we got a opuka from our own now. No, we're the Lahui Kanaka. We're the Oivia of this place. You know, how you try to define that for you, that's you guys. But for us guys, as our kupuna called themselves, we the lahui kanaka. And that's how we define ourselves. <clears throat> one of the things that, you know, I want to quote out, you know, George Helm to me was, you know, in a way, of course, lost his life way too short, prophetic in things that he had said, and Mahalo that he had put things on paper. And one of the quotes he says, you know, far worse than losing one's land 
is losing one's identity, one's culture, one language, one's sense of identity. I want you guys to think about that. They're far worse than losing land is losing one's identity and culture and language and history. And it kind of tied into, you know, um, the sense of without that, you see, without that sense of your history and knowledge of self, now you end up teaching and treating the land, or looking at the land in ways in which it never came from. Okay, example, language. Here's the language. This is why I always say Hawaiian and concept is important. If we're going to survive, we got to know the difference. When I say real estate, translate real estate into Hawaiian. No more. See, the Hawaiian word for aina, no equal real estate. Well, no, and it, it, that, no, it goes directly with what he's saying. No, no, it's an no, it's it introduced right here. Yeah. No, so, so the word. <laughs> what? Not alorio, eh? No, no, no. No, estate. Actually, it's called kuleana nui. Kuleana, okay. No, it is. That's interest, what it is. Interest. Yeah, that's the freehold estate. But we got to remember, they never say aloha real estate. <laughs> or aloha kuleana. Oh, what do you guys remember this? You guys got to understand this. Because we get, we get caught up in this language today. People are talking about, oh, this much money, real estate, what's the... And the point being, aina, aina, aina is not real estate. And that's where we get confused. Aina is always there. You know, and Ken will say, you know, you can steal the land. That's right. Maybe evicted from the land. <laughs> but the land is always here. You know, Uncle Eddie used to say, Liwi kapaakai, Liwi kapaakai. All this ancient, we're still here. We're still here. You know, the great, as you know, Stephen Biko, one of the quotes you guys know, I always say, Stephen Biko, the great South African, revolutionary. He was so powerful, they killed him. And he always said, the greatest weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. The greatest weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. If I teach you to look at land as real estate, I got your ass. <laughs> but if you continue to coo and say, no, it's Aina, it's Aina, it's Aina, we live on. See, that's what the struggle is. That's why things about, you know, the question I was asked about governing entity versus government. To me, it's a very important question. Let me ask this question. Will a governing entity stop what's happening at Kwaya Ha'o? I want you guys to think about that. What is a governing entity? The neighborhood board is a governing entity. The county council is a governing entity. That's not what I want. If I'm going to fight and struggle on, I want to make sure Nawe doesn't happen again. I want to make sure the waters in Navai Eha flow again. You know, I want to make sure uh, when I, you know, the overthrow, you know, I don't, some of you guys know, when you watch your family lose land, and you got to sit and watch your father and try to explain to him what the hell just happened. Place that we have always been at from time immemorial. And so I tell myself, if the governing entity ain't going to solve that question, that's not where I go in, because I'm going to keep on struggling. Now, and for me, that's what I'm trying to say. That's ea o kaina. I don't know all the answers, and that's why I look to the, you know, people to learn. But I know my now telling me where I got to go. Look at education. Is the governing entity going to stop things like no child left behind? Which is forcing us to teach our kids like real estate. <laughs> Forget Aina. It's all about real estate. See, that's the power of education. Unless we control our own education, I mean, let me just drop this. I know we brought up, I went, you know, I was like pick on Kamehameha schools, and that's what I always like to do. <laughs> you guys know me. Right? 
The lady in that supposed Hanai non Hawaiian kid into the school, 10,000 people running around in red shirts. Everybody getting excited. Oh my God, they get a non Hawaiian in the school. Okay. You guys may have a problem. I don't, honestly. My kids go to Hawaiian immersion schools. I get non Hawaiian kids right next to my kids in Hawaiian immersion schools. They don't make the school any less Hawaiian. And I tell, I ask people, gee, how come when they hire the headmaster, the person who's going to set policy, you know the guy who's, who picks who can go and go into the school, the consultants, the trustees, I don't see 10,000 guys running around the sea streets. And this is the point I want to say, it's not about who goes to the school, it's about who's controlling the school. That's the effect. But you see how we get tricked into getting all excited over something. It is meaningless. And, I, and again, I, I'm not, you know, and I always say, I want to change that school from an institution for Hawaiians to Hawaiian institution. That's not one and the same thing. And the way they do that, again, is through political power. Working the system and angles to get us to one day to make it happen. And we know, like Kato said, when they're doing something against you, you know you're on the right track. That attack on the institution, the attack on all these things are occurring because they see what's going on in the community. But we cannot get caught up in, you know, sometimes we get involved with the eyes and the prize. And all of us did different kuleana, perhaps, in what we do. Like my brother Keanu. You know, I mean, he, he get his thing going down. But I know this. I know his heart over here, the now, is good. You know, I know all the things that they were, in the intention of the past to do what they did was, what we got to do to survive. But we got to keep the eyes in the prize. Let me end by quoting Malcolm X now. <laughs> that's the, that's the ancient Hawaiian. And I'll go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no, this is a lesson for us. It's for politics. Malcolm X said, the greatest mistake is organizing a sleeping people. You have to first wake them up to the humanity, the culture, and then you get action. I repeat them again. The greatest mistake is organizing a sleeping people. You have to first wake them up to the humanity, to the culture, to the identity, to self-knowledge. Then you get action. See, that's why things like Ahakani to me are so important. To me, this is big time heavy political going down out here. But many times they don't know. You know, you start to think like a Hawaiian, politically, how are you going to start to vote and act like? When Hawaiian. You see? But if I talk in, you know, I mean, I'm not to, I'm, I'm apologizing if I, but if I got to go give one guy one t-shirt to go sign his name to one paper, what the hell kind of nation is that? I'm going to sign my name for give him a free t-shirt. Shit, I don't want to be part of that nation. Is that, how, is that it? You know when you know when you're good, is people going to be coming out from the woodworks to want to put the name there. Why? Because their sense of who they are is so important. They know. That's where I'm going to head. And I'm not saying that's I'm just trying to say, but again, Malcolm X said, the greatest mistake is trying to organize a sleeping people. You have to first wake them up to the humanity. We as Kanaka, we've been around for a long time. We have a history. We have a language. We have a purpose. Then you get action. So, sorry about extended. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> You're a ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sole. Thank, thank you for uh, Kuku Hawaii. Talk about the radical days. And, um, well, first of all, I, I, I agree. Um, except the only quote I could come up with was Rap Brown, you know. H. Rap Brown, the power is at the point of the gun, but I don't think that was, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was uh, appropriate. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have very little <coughs> to add to this, except to reinforce the concept that government 
and nation is not the same thing. That, you know, it's, it, the government is what exercises rule or whatever. But governments, the whole world was, we, only in America, we think that they're the same thing. I mean, some people think that's the same thing. I mean, all over the world, governments come and go, but nations remain. So the idea that, uh, and one of the fallacies of the whole Indian law situation is this insistence on, um, on uh, that, that the government equals tribe equals nation. It, it doesn't work like that. And then uh, to understand, it also calls for an understanding of the difference between power and sovereignty, or the, or the concept of nation and power. I mean, a lot of what we do, we do not because, I mean, a lot of what we do, we do because uh, the other guys have the power. <laughs> I mean, simply. I mean, you, you, you went to jail because they could put you there. You know, not because your argument or your basis was wrong. And uh, so you, 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 that's part of the understanding. A lot of people think that because, you know, a Hawaiian government doesn't exist, that means the nation doesn't. No, the nation belongs to us. I mean, we're, we're the beneficiaries. We are the nation. And what we are trying to do is, um, is exercise the nationhood, which is eventually, you know, have our own government or whatever. In terms of what the projection is for the future, see, my, my feeling is that I used to think that you got to think about the way it all, you know, what the ideal situation is. Now I think we just need to take the next step. <laughs> And the first most important step to me is that we define ourselves. That it's self-definition. That what the future is, is what we decide it should be. And the problem may be, in the political sense, that all too often we are let other people define us. That we don't decide how this nation ought to look like, how we ought to act, how we ought to progress. I mean, the weakness and no offense meant because he's a great person, but the weakness of the Kaka bill was everybody was deciding everything except the nation. You know, they weren't in the room. So no matter how good or how, how good it might have been or whatever the intentions might have been, you got to decide whether or not, I mean, if legitimacy existed. So the first step is for us to decide what it is that uh, we are going to evolve into. And my, my prediction is unless you do that, what we have is what we have. And so, anyway, happy Father's Day, everybody. We're, we gotta leave at 12, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but I, as the as a facilitator, I, I got the last question. So, so we've got we've got these uh, these. I mean, they don't like to call themselves leaders, but the three very effective leaders that want to help Hawaiians, you know, straight from the heart. And we, and and they and they all projected it today and showed how they do it. Uh, we also have we also have a leader in Governor Waihei who's who is he has stealthily helped Hawaiians by the way he got to become governor and what he did there. And now, and now he's in the, now he's uh, the head of this role commission. And uh, even though it was started as, a, as an act of the Hawaii legislature in 2011, I mean, you know what he wants to do with that. And, and he's going, you know, this is, this is uh, his full 100% project right now. And he kind of told you what his, what his goal is. Um, and, and my question to these two uh, leaders is, um, what can you do to, to help him? Well, it's not a matter of helping each other, but it's really a matter of knowing who we are, because as we know who we are, we naturally help each other. So Laulima will come not from me trying to help somebody, 
but by me knowing my kuleana, he got a kuleana, we collaborate. That's how it's supposed to work. Otherwise, somebody telling me I got to talk to him, you know. So I know Kale Koa from a long time ago. Yeah, when we used to have here, <laughs> long time ago. So I knew Kale Koa before we got involved with any of these kind of things. And he's still the same guy. And Kale Koa knows I'm still the same guy. It's just when we got to turn on the switch to something, boom, we turn them on. When we got to turn them off, we turn it off. That's, that's the color of the mo'o that I talk about. So I've learned how to change my color to blue. That was not inherent in me. That was a learned thing. Yeah. So what we need to do is to find our commonality. And I found when you find commonality is when you understand your history. The one thing that I found that was so effectual in unifying our people was not telling everybody to unify. You remember when the Kuwait petitions went around? The Kuwait petitions, the, the 21,269 signatures. Who Aloha Aina that killed the treaty? They brought it down from the National um, Archives. Made a partnership with Bishop Museum and they went on the islands. All our people did was they never say nothing. All they did was look for their grandparents. Look for their great-grandparents. Some, even Kupuna, found their parents. That was a unifier. That was a commonality. Because what they accomplished back then was profound. But what they did back then had a specific intent to kill the treaty. It was not to say we are together. It was to kill the treaty because we protest annexation in any way, shape, or form. It says it right there, the preamble. It didn't say we're coming together to be a, good, to be a unified people. They came to their, together because they understood what would happen if that treaty was ratified. That sh shows they understood what was happening. Now, for me to know the past is really to understand and take advantage of what happened. To capitalize on the successes, learn from the mistakes. So I can share with Kale Koa when he started to talk about the Aina versus the real estate. Actually, our kupuna did separate them. Aina was Aina. Real estate was Kuleana Nui. Further broken down into Makeana Lorio, Malalo Iho Okeana Lorio. Real estate is not ownership of land. Real estate is ownership of control of the aina, whether leasehold, fee, or life estate. That's very different. Because you cannot own land. Land is actually controlled by the country. That's why you can be evicted off your land if you don't pay your taxes. Because they are the true owners. And that happened in the kingdom era. But what we have is the use of the land. That's where we get into malama aina. There are certain rules that we got to follow. To know that our kupuna did that is key. But we used to think our kupuna didn't do that. They was told to do that. Now, it's a different thing when I can say Joseph Navahi said this specifically about journal partnerships in the Hawaiian kingdom, run your own business. Oh, that changes everything because I thought the Haole was telling us to do that. No, very different. Navahi was promoting hui, huis all over Hilo, corporations. You guys can look them up, but we never did before, so we don't know. So we think this Western concept was our enemy when in fact, no. It's just our concept. And what the hell is a Western concept? How far west you got to go? Where you, what east side you on? What west side? You know, where's west? It's bullshit. All it is is our kupuna did this because they understood what to do. No different than our kupuna is using this mic right now. Well, we're using the mic because you guys can hear better. <laughs> it doesn't make me holy. It doesn't make me Western. If Maui Loa had, had fiberglass, brother would have used it. <laughs> You know, it's called evolution. <laughs> you know, so, so we need to know that our understanding is very important. Now, one last thing I just want to close up with is some people ask me, you know, how come you say this but nobody else says it? Had all these other people doing research, professors. And you know what? I, I kept thinking to myself, that's right. It's really simple. Why don't they get it? And you know what it really boils down to? We got the wrong theory. See, our history... It's a game of football. That's our history. The use of the word touchdown, running back, tight end, wide receiver, guard, that's our kupuna. The game we're playing today, baseball. We are trying to come up with plays using baseball theory in a football game. It's really that simple. And you know when we look at the, the ball, kind of oblong, huh? supposed to be round like on baseball, we blame the holy. You guys got that one, huh? Blame the holy because it's oblong. 
we never know. That's on football. Yeah? When we talk about, um, uh, talking about one home run, actually, that's a touchdown. Now, the thing is, why do we think like that, though? We didn't just wake up and start talking baseball. I'm sitting on three doctoral committees right now up at UH. The information that is coming out from 1899 to, I would say, 1930, Hawaii's history books in the Department of Education was revised by W.D. Alexander. And that is when he started to introduce these ideas of baseball. So, just, so James Kaulia, leader of Hui Aloha Aina, the president who got that signature petition for the men, and Ms. Kuahelani Campbell, president of the Women's Association, they knew what football was. But the children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren will be taught in the schools baseball. That's why we didn't understand what they did till today until Professor Noi Noi Silva brings it out into the open. Now we start asking the questions, and I think that's what's important. So when we talk about who we are, we cannot say who we want to be. We got to say we are who we were. We are who we were, and who were we as we were. Now you take him back to your kupuna. In order to know who we are, who was my tutu? Who was my great-grandfather? And then we come to that realization. So that's how I see it. It's very, I'm very careful to not tell people where we should go because then it looks like my opinion. But I can show you somebody fell off the cliff and died. What's your decision? <laughs> that's the pass right there, brother. You like take that route? Your call? Because if you die, that's just another piece of the mo'olelo I'm going to learn from. It's called being hothead. Po'opakiki. <laughs> we also got to learn from that. So, we see, so I was sharing with the governor and about my wife. And I say this respectfully to everyone. I tell my wife, I'm never wrong. I'm never wrong. I'm just temporarily off track. <laughs> <laughs> so you help me get back on track. I help you get back on track. That way it's so, not so definitive you're wrong. See, it becomes an argument. I think for all of us as a people, we have to accept the fact that it's okay to be temporarily off track. And that is where our kuleana comes in to help each other to get back on track, which is what I was saying before. My kuleana will tell me how I got to work yeah, with everybody. Mahalo. The first thing to mahalo our pohana for the whole ahakane. Um, come on up upon a crab. Kiola, Jan, working hard, Kiola. Kalapuna, Umi, Kai, and the rest of the gang. You know, um, and I've always felt, you know, having these kinds of conversations um, is really what we need out there in the community to learn from one another, to have the possibility to hear. And when you hear, you learn. And when you learn, you move. Lokahi. Um, you know, the great Frederick Douglass, you know, has that saying, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. And in Kalikua, I want to add to that. <laughs> if there's no struggle, there's no unity. The unity comes from, in my perspective, is having the sense of purpose of moving towards a particular destination. And I talked about the canoe story last time, so I'm not going through the whole canoe. But for me, you know, that's why I really appreciate. And I, I, you know, I want to mahalo Kia Aina and my brother, Keanu, you know, being on this panel together. Um, the purpose has always been the betterment of our people, that we shall survive and we shall flourish into the future. Now, how we get there in that journey, we may have differences of opinions, but that's nothing wrong. You know, Mama Hale, Mama Hale I was real close with. One day we're sitting down, and we happened to watch these two Hawaiians going at it as a, not, not a fight, but there were a disagreement going on. And she turned to me and she goes, Oh, Kaliko, you see? Nani kapoi Hawaii. They say, she said, You see how smart are people? That's beautiful. But we love each other. And she said, You know why? Because our people, we're not hipa, we're not sheep. We were born this way, this kind of great intelligence to know that how we do things in one place might not be the same in somewhere else. You know, for example, those of you who grow kalo, we know that. How you grow kalo in Keanai doesn't mean you're going to work the same way you grow the kalo in Kahakuloa. Because the conditions may be different. The kind of water you have or no more water or too much water may be very different. And so perspectives on how to get the produce done 
come from very different understandings. So there's nothing wrong with farming kalo in different ways. That's the point. The purpose to feed, that's the thing we've got to remember. That's the lokahi. Um, and I was sharing with uh, the Kia Aina earlier, you know, when uh, looking at his, the history of his own work. You know, and I said, you know, if it wasn't, for example, in 1978, in his hard work to get Hawaiian language as a, one of the official two languages, things like Hawaiian studies programs may be very limited. There perhaps may not even be a Hawaiian language immersion program that all my children attend. You know, the, the great French philosopher, Foucault, <laughs> said this, as I was sharing. Yeah, I don't know French, so I had to borrow that. But I was sharing with, with the Kiaina. You know, he says, we know what one does, but we never know what one does, does. <laughs> I repeat again. We know what one does, but we never know what one does, does. Yeah, so I'm sure in 1978, perhaps they had no idea that one day you would have the possibilities of immersion schools in the Hawaiian language. And so you can imagine what we do here. That's why I say what we do here, the kind of connections that we have, the things that we share, what I learn. I mean, we don't know what this will do into the future. And to me, that's, and that's the hope of these kinds of, and that's why I say these kinds of conferences are so important. The fact that we can gather like this are so important. We can have this kind of conversation. We have the ability to dream, to talk, to share, to listen, to show our aloha and compassion for one another. Because that's what's going to make us live on. Last quote. <laughs> the strongest swimmers swim in the roughest seas. The strongest swimmers swim in the roughest seas. And when you think about Hawaii, there's no place in the world that's militarized, missionized, touristized, <laughs> than Hawaii. When you look at the kind of things we deal with, I mean, just the overall, I mean, the whole world is upon us sometimes. And yet we're still here. Yet we still cry out for justice. Yet we still struggle for a better day. See, it's easy to be native in a place where nobody like be. Right? You can be a native easy of some mountain, nobody's up there. It's easy. But try being native in a place when you're just inundated with the world. And that tells me something about our people. We're strong. We're in the rough seas. And we're still swimming. That tells you something about the people. The strongest swimmers swim in the roughest seas. This is something we should celebrate. We should acknowledge. And I was, you know, this is, this is not surprising. If you know our history, this is not surprising. We come from people who have always been innovative. We come from people who have always been on the move. As I tease my Samoan friends sometimes, you weren't the one that was sleeping when the va'a would leave. <laughs> I want you guys to think about that. We come from, that's, that's the kind of people we are. Our kupuna was the movers and shakers. That's, that's in our DNA. That's a part of our genetic history. You know, right? Our people, what did we do in 1843? You know, what did they do in 1843? To become a recognized independent nation state. The first of any real native peoples. The non-European. That's what they did. They did that. For somebody like Lili Okalani to go against the most powerful military force at that time and be smart and akamai, brain against brain, is Kala Okalani. She knew you couldn't play with the bullies. She had to do whatever she had to do. So today, we still can struggle on. That's intelligence. So my point is that, that is part of who we are. You know, I remember, I remember when having a discussion, and these Hawaiians, these Hawaiians say, what, Kalikoi, you think we can uh, run our own country? And I'm like, and this was back there, I was like, well, we have a governor of the state of Hawaii who is Hawaiian, we get one set up. I'm just like, you know, obviously we can. But we've been taught to believe somehow we know can. Yeah? 
So we should admire, recognize that strength. Be who we are. And the struggle is going to go on. Hopefully it gets easier. <laughs> I better tell you very truthfully. <laughs> You know, and Keanu knows this. I mean, this is, this is you know, I'm going to quote Gandhi. My last one. This is my last one for sure. <laughs> Gandhi said, Gandhi said, first, they ignore you. Then, they laugh at you. Then, they fight you. And then, you win. Thank you. Mahalo. <clears throat> I, I too want to thank uh, Kamanao and uh, and all of the people that are involved with this Ahakani for uh, inviting me here today and for allowing me to participate. I, you know, if you're going to talk about Hawaiian political leadership, I mean, it's what's happening right here. I mean, this is politics and political organizing. <clears throat> at, at, its, at its best. And if I was the opposition, <laughs> I wouldn't sleep tonight if I knew that Hawaiians were meeting here and talking about their identity and talking about uh, their future and their past and their history. I know, but so you can agree with me that when you were out there organizing, and getting people together. A meeting like this is where it gets started, where political action gets started. And, I, and as I said, you know, to be part of this is, uh, first of all, mahalo. And, um, you know, when you talk about uh, Hawaiian unity and how we can help each other, well, first of all, our history. Our history is what it, what unites us all. I mean, the, the young man talking about our genealogy, that, that's, these are the things that, that unite us. But I, I, I can remember, I'm going to make some quotes now. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember uh, one of the, the great Hawaiian philosopher, Arthur Trask. Oh, yeah, you remember Uncle Arthur Trask. And this is a, a long time ago, and we were at this Puvalu in those days, and we were, you know, discussing all the same uh, issues that we are still grappling with and, uh, and, and where we should go. And as usual, because there are intelligent people in the room, there were differences of opinion, you know. And some people were, uh, and I was sitting in the group, and uh, Arthur Trask was sitting here, and, he, uh, and, then, and somebody said something like, why can't you guys get, you know, Hawaiians get along? And Uncle Arthur stood up and he said, you know, we are a seafaring people. <laughs> and when you are seafaring people, you all learn to paddle your own canoe. But somehow, the miracle was we all arrive at the same place. <laughs> you see? This whole thing about us discussing and us doing this and us having difference of opinion, if it wasn't important, there would be no difference of opinion. You know, when you know that you are getting somewhere is when we start to think it's important enough to discuss it, to deal with it, and to handle it, you know. And so that's the magic of coming together, the magic of discussions like today. And... I think that when anybody says that, you say, you know, that's wonderful. I used to say, you know, <laughs> when I was in office, Naaleho, you saw Naaleho, he's another one of these young generation. He used to be with his mother protesting what we were doing, you know, <laughs> everything we're doing. And now we are, we, we are together. And, 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 I, and I told him, I said, you know, you, you have to understand that half of what we had accomplish or put together would not have been possible if it wasn't for the people out there telling us we weren't doing enough. So I tell the, my, my fellow politician, you know, instead of getting upset about people who have a strong point of view, you should go kiss them because if it wasn't for them, you couldn't accomplish anything. 
you know, if it wasn't for the people, you know, it's, it's amazing, but Mililani Trask was with Kalahui, was out there talking about the nation within the nation before we even heard of the Kaka Bill. It's passe. But if she never took the first step, we wouldn't be talking nationhood today. You know? And so, all of us, unity to me is whether we are all moving in the same direction. And the miracle is we can all get there. <laughs> you know, the other miracle is we survived. You know, I went to, uh, which is what you were talking about, Kawai Hau Church once. And actually, I s there was this, uh, no, not Kawai Hau, uh, Kamak Kamakapili. And they had this uh, chart on the wall. And it was an old chart from the Department of Health. You know, and it charted out the populations by ethnic groups in Hawaii. And it showed the Hawaiians were started off way up here and the line dropped down there, it just almost disappeared and started coming back up. And all the other ethnic groups went like this. And it was, I mean, it brought tears to my eyes. I, I, I stood there and I, and I started like tearing up to just see a visual presentation of what we now call the, our struggle. And then all of a sudden, you know, I became very proud and very happy because despite all of this, we survive. You know, that is a miracle. And we're coming back. And the nation survives. And the nation is coming back, whether you're ready for it or not. Aloha. Thank you. I just want to thank our panel today and uh, mahalo. I'm